today I want to talk about uh, tackling the climate crisis with the secret sauce or the magic formula of facts, feelings, and action. My research as a scientist, of course, is focused on this uh, first part, establishing the facts, but increasingly I'm realizing that what we most need is climate action. And to get there, we know what we have to do from the science, but feelings are a way to bridge the facts and the action that we need. And this has really come home for me in a very personal way because the place that I'm from and the people and places that I love the most are already feeling dangerous and scary and terrible impacts from human-caused climate change. So this is a view from the place where I grew up. This is my parents' uh, vineyard above the town of Sonoma in California. And it was a uh, wine industry that I studied for my PhD. And already 15 years ago, we were seeing impacts from climate change on the wine industry and on landscapes. But this has only become much starker and more devastating recently, not least the, the current extreme heat that is exacerbated by human-caused climate change. So this is really the takeaway from my talk. Um, we happen to be alive at a moment where life on Earth is in big trouble, and that's both nature and people and human civilizations. And because we're here at this critical moment, it is up to us to fix it. And what I mean by fixing it is doing everything in our power to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees of warming. That is the aim of the Paris Agreement to avoid the worst impacts of the climate crisis. We also need to stop biodiversity loss because we rely on nature to keep us alive. Those are our life support systems. And also because uh, many wonderful and beautiful and unique and special places and species on earth deserve protecting. And to do that, we need to put human well-being at the center of our economies, our lives, our policies. So if I sum up, uh, which I've done on a protest sign, a footnoted protest sign that you can see down in the bottom corner, what does climate science tell us? Looking at the synthesis reports from the UN Climate Panel, IPCC, we can sum it up in what um, has been called the climate haiku, which is, it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, we can fix it. And as researchers, please feel free to dive into the references, but these are the high level takeaways uh, and please share these messages because research shows that people need to understand these five points, both to grasp the urgency and the seriousness of the climate crisis and to be willing and able to make both behavior changes ourselves and to support the necessary ambitious climate policies. So one point I want to make that's really important to understand, we will not stop climate change until we completely stop adding carbon to the atmosphere. And the reason for that is that some carbon lasts 10,000 years or more, causing warming that whole time. That is about twice the age of, for example, the Great Pyramids or Stonehenge. So if we imagine that carbon pollution uh, from our factories and cars and land use and agriculture as uh, water coming out of a tap into a bathtub, we have to stabilize the level that's coming in with what uh, we can take out. Right now, nature cleans up about half of our carbon mess for free, absorbing it in the land and on, in the oceans. Um, but the potential to increase those sinks is unfortunately limited. And basically, we have to get to the root of the problem and completely turn off the tap. So completely stop adding uh, carbon to the atmosphere. A very quick illustration shows how urgent this is. And this is our carbon budget to, again, stay within 1.5 degrees, uh, limit the, the worst of climate change. And we see how quickly and how much of the carbon budget we have already used up, primarily from the US and Europe. So especially accelerating in uh, recent years, we have about seven years left, uh, less than 10 years of current emissions to make the carbon budget a reality and to actually stop climate change around 1.5 degrees. So there is no time to waste. At the moment, we're not doing nearly enough. World government's uh, current policies under the Paris Agreement are headed for about three degrees Celsius of global warming. And that is absolutely catastrophic. We are already seeing the dangerous impacts of just above one degree of warming that we've experienced to date. And I don't think we can tolerate and certainly not thrive in a world of three degrees of warming. So you can see how much quicker we need to reduce emissions. And this is primarily fossil fuel emissions. Um, and this next decade is really critical. From now until 2030 is 
humanity's last best chance to actually stabilize the climate in a range where humans and nature can continue to thrive. So we have a big job and uh, it is up to us because previous generations and previous us and previous leaders have not done enough and we're now the last ones who can make these changes. Um, we know that the world today is unequal and unsustainable. There are only about a billion people who live on the level of um, income and consumption that we are maybe used to in places like the European astronomers might be familiar with on the right hand side here. But I show this to, to emphasize that it is actually a small group globally who are causing the most climate pollution, um, especially those in extreme poverty have extremely low climate pollution and have nothing to cut and indeed need to increase their uh, consumption to meet their basic needs so that they have healthy and, and clean and safe water and food and so on. So um, and that doesn't cost a lot of carbon to do that. So this is to point the finger that those of us with the highest emissions have the most responsibility. And in a sense, um, we are actually all developing countries because there is no country in the world at the moment that is sustainable. What this shows is on the x-axis, uh, physical boundaries to a safe operating space for the planet. So biophysical limits regarding climate change and nitrogen pollution, for example. And on the y-axis is sustainability. So indicators of meeting human needs like education, gender and income e equality, uh, democracy and so on. So what we want is good life for everybody without overstepping the planet's boundaries. And at the moment, there is no country that's doing that. We have rich countries that are mostly meeting human needs, but dramatically exceeding the planet's carrying capacity or the planet's ability to, to um, support us. And we have poor countries that are treading lightly on the environment, but not meeting human needs. So every country needs to be on a path towards this uh, corner to sustainability. What it will take to get there is simple, but not easy. Um, first, we have to get to the root of the problem and stop, leave fossil fuels in the ground, basically. So stop transferring coal, oil, and gas from geological reserves in the earth to the atmosphere, because that is the cause of about three quarters of our climate problem. And that means we have to stop the production and consumption of fossil fuels. And uh, I just, I write a monthly newsletter called We Can Fix It on Substack. I have a link at the end. I would love for you to subscribe if you're interested. Um, today's issue just went out this morning and it is about um, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So actually getting policies in place to stop the expansion, extraction and production of fossil fuels on this side, which is absolutely necessary. Um, but simultaneously, we also have to look at consumption because these same fossil fuels are being used to produce the goods and services and mobility and heating and so on that we consume. And actually households are the main consumers. So private individuals, especially those of us in the top 10%, are the main consumers and over consumers need to reduce our consumption. So what, in addition to leaving fossil fuels in the ground, the second thing we need to do is protect and care for and restore and regenerate nature like our lives depend on it because they truly do. So enhancing um, and protecting the land and oceans and it will support its ability to continue to take up carbon. Um, but not, you know, these are not just, these ecosystems are not just a, a carbon sink. They um, regulate so much of life on earth and we absolutely depend on them as well as having space in, intact for other species to live and to thrive. So I've summed this up in my new book uh, as three principles we can use to shift from what I call the exploitation mindset to a mindset of regeneration. So from being at war with nature and uh, erroneously putting some humans above others to prioritizing um, all people and respecting life, both human and uh, non-human life. So humans and nature putting us at the center of our well-being as um, the main goal uh, that we're working towards. Stop harming life. So getting to the root cause of problems and stop doing unsustainable things that are causing the climate and biodiversity crises and strengthen life. So increase our capacity, our resilience and ability to thrive. And I'll just show a little bit quickly on, again, this 
how basically our responsibility and our capacity to um, act on climate change really scales with our income and our emissions. This graph just shows the enormous difference between how much uh, those of us who are high emitters to qualify for this top 10% you need to earn about 32, sorry, 38,000 US dollars per year. So certainly many academics are well in that category, something around 30,000 euros or so roughly. Um, we are in this group that causes about half of global climate household pollution. And that's, we have to cut the pollution in half by 2030 to be on track for 1.5 degrees. A lot of the pollution is coming from overconsumption and that needs to be a focus. But importantly, if we, if we look at European um, personal carbon budgets and household consumption, we see again this enormous difference and we see where it's coming from that especially as incomes increase and emissions increase, it's because we tend to drive more and especially to fly more. This purple bar shows how much emissions come from flying and the pink is from driving. And you see that those are the categories that increase the most uh, as we go from average to high emitters. And those are the biggest areas for consumption, reducing emissions fast. And basically in order to get to 1.5 degrees, we need a zero carbon society. So we have to have incentives and infrastructure and policies and politics that make it possible for everyone to meet our needs in a carbon-free way. But we also have to, if we're in this group here, tackle overconsumption and reduce our own emissions. And that's a lot of what I write about in Under the Sky We Make, that journey that I've been on myself, um, drawing from our research, showing that going flight, car, and meat-free have the biggest personal impacts on, on climate change. And I've gone from, uh, now I'm a recovering frequent flyer, so I was somewhere in this emissions group before, and I'm now somewhere around here. Um, the biggest change I made was to retire my frequent flyer card, which is now in a museum looking back uh, from the, the future, where we did actually manage to stabilize the climate. And I think we really have to rethink um, frequent flying. It's not something that is compatible with a stable and safe climate. And so we need to think about how to do our academic work in other ways. And that's something that uh, we in my department at Lund University have been doing. I have a lot of resources on my website uh, for academics interested in flying less. I'll just briefly mention food as another critical part of the, the, form, the, the picture. Uh, about a quarter of climate pollution comes from our use of land and agriculture. And the biggest reason there is uh, industrial meat production or animal production overall. So a healthy and sustainable diet would have a plate that looks something like this. And key is that plants, uh, so fruits and vegetables cover about half the plate. And if animal protein is there, it is as an accent or a highlight rather than the main dish. Finally, um, I wanna focus also on political actions and it's not only uh, personal actions that we need, but political actions are also super important. I focus a lot on this uh, in my own book. I can recommend this book by Seth Wines, which gets at the most effective political actions and ways to actually take collective action. And that's been a topic of my newsletter as well. So with that, I'd love to stop and um, take a few questions. And I would love to hear from you um, either as a newsletter subscriber, you're very welcome connecting on social media. Um, I'm doing a lot of virtual book talks these days and would love to speak with your institution or book club if it's something of interest. Um, and I hope this gives some, some resources and uh, concrete steps that you can take because we really need you to be part of Team Climate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and uh, thank you for the attendees. So I just remind you, if you want to ask questions, please use the Slack channel that is dedicated to the session. Um, and also we put the links towards your book, your website, your Twitter, <laughs> so to advertise if you want to follow up uh, Kimberly's work. So one of the first questions comes from Victoria, and she's asking, what would you recommend to people who admit that there is a climate change uh, made by us, but who do not believe or claim that we can't do anything? Well, so most Americans, the data from Yale show, and this is similar uh, in other places as well, do know that and there's a climate crisis caused by people and are either concerned or alarmed about it. So that is good news because people are informed. I think um, I see climate doom as one of the stages that in what I call radical climate acceptance. So basically going from ignorance of the problem, avoiding the problem, being overwhelmed and drowning in doom about the problem 
And the, the, the pathway that I found out of that is through focusing on feelings and purpose as a guide and values as a guide to what really matters to us and being able to focus on meaningful action. And I, a lot of what I've focused on here today and really the whole focus of my, my book and my work is on trying to um, highlight what meaningful action is and what it looks like because we do know from research that we can act, we have the ability both individually and collectively to act and um, we, it, it does matter what we do. Yeah, actually, there is a, a very similar question by Leo asking, like, what is your opinion or st st about um, individual actions versus systemic uh, change? And it goes with another question by two people who says, were saying, so here was like the individual uh, carbon footprint, but what about our job, our work? So what are we doing in research? And in another way, do we have to forbid people to go to fly, to go to conferences or stuff, things, similar things. So what's your point about that? Yeah, a lot of questions there. Um, I can recommend an article by Maddie Grist, who wrote about um, this individual versus collective question. Oh, sorry, Maddie Stone is the journalist's name. She wrote in Grist uh, an article with the title something like, Cutting Your Carbon Footprint Really Matters If You're Rich. And this kind of encapsulates my argument that those of us who are high emitters actually do need to make uh, individual changes. And this is part of a larger systemic and cultural and social change that supports and enables and speeds up political and, and system change. Um, so we know that, yeah, read chapter eight, basically, of my book. This is where I lay out the evidence and the arguments that personal and system change are really connected and reinforce each other. Um, and that it's this group of us who are in the top 10% and even higher emitters who need to make personal change. Other people, especially marginalized groups, do not. So it's not about uh, lifestyle changes for, for those groups. Academics, um, I have on my website a lot of resources about academics flying less. I think we do need to lead by example. Um, there are universities who are taking leadership on this. Sweden has a um, climate framework that says that Swedish universities will be in line with uh, what's needed to meet the 1.5 degree goal by 2030. And that means we have to be cutting emissions around 16% per year starting now. That is a lot. Um, we know what to do in order to do that. We are not doing it yet, but universities are starting to get serious about it. And I think um, those of us in the places that are producing the knowledge and teaching students and um, you know really generating this information need to, to walk the talk and put our own research and those of our colleagues into practice. So I can recommend looking at the Swedish climate uh, framework for higher education because that really lays out um, 13 action areas from research to teaching to campus operations and uh, what needs to be done. So pushing hard on universities, both faculty and students and staff is a really important thing we can do. So actually that comes to the very last question. If uh, you have a quick answer summary for that, it's uh, by Hannah, the co-chair of our session today. Um, how did you actually convince our university to take actions? Ooh. Um, yeah, how do you make change happen? Well, research shows you need pushes and pulls. So carrots and sticks. You need um, options to be available, attractive options. Uh, so that's the, the pull. And politicians and leaders love to talk about that. Like, hey, let's here's some shiny new tech. Let's scale this up. Here's investment and innovation. That's great. But we also need to push away from the unsustainable status quo. And that comes from a loud, vocal, creative, peaceful, but um, agitated group of uh, committed students and faculty and community members who make it impossible to ignore the climate question, who raise uncomfortable questions at faculty meetings, who hold the university to account. I mean, I think we have a very powerful case because, for example, the university's mission is to understand, explain, and improve the world and the human condition. And if we're going to do that and we're going to put those values, which I think are very wonderful, into practice, then we have to walk the talk. So um, student groups are very active. I've supported, for example, Lund University divesting their investments from fossil fuel and sh shifting to clean investments. Our pension funds also need to be divested. So, I mean, there's no better place to start with climate action than the places we already are with the contacts and connections and um, skills and 
and gifts that we already have. So I think universities really need to be in the forefront of, of leading the change.